Okay, everybody, welcome. Uh, I thank everybody for coming here tonight. My name is Paul O'Neill, and on behalf of Kingston's Buried Treasures, we want to again welcome you here to our uh, ninth uh, presentation, and it's the part of our series. The subject tonight is the history of the Ulster County Courthouse, birthplace of New York State. Uh, and our courthouse is really an amazing place. Uh, our featured presenter tonight is, as you can see, me. So <laughs> before we begin, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, again, my name is Paul O'Neill, and I am the Commissioner of Jurors for Ulster County. And in that capacity, I am privileged to be able to go to work every day in the Ulster County Courthouse, because as I said, it's, it's an amazing place. All courthouses are amazing places because courthouses are where uh, justice is done. Uh, courthouses are where we can go, uh, simply by being members of a community, to have our disputes resolved within the framework of a set of rules that inure to the benefit of us all. But while all courthouses are important, ours is a little bit different. Uh, the Ulster County Courthouse is not only one of the most important places in Ulster County, it's one of the most important places in the United States. And for those of you who have been regular attendees uh, for our lecture series, parts of tonight's presentation uh, are gonna be sort of a refresher for you because some of the people we're gonna discuss tonight have been past subjects of our lecture series. Uh, and that's because it's impossible to discuss the members of our community who have made such a monumental impact on history without discussing the history of the courthouse. Because almost all of these individuals at one time or another and in one capacity or another, have graced the halls of our courthouse. Uh, so I'm going to give you tonight a, a very brief nutshell version of the, of the courthouse, but there is a lot. So I promise you that you will be out of here by 1030 tonight. I promise <laughs> you. Uh, my daughter is here. She's six years old. She has to get to bed. So I promise you. So let's begin. And for us, the beginning is 1609. And in 1609, Henry Hudson sailed up the Hudson River in his ship, the Half Moon. And in his journals, he wrote about what we now believe is the Roundout River Basin. And the Roundout River Basin is a unique river basin on the Hudson because it's one of the few deep channel basins on the Hudson River. There's some documentary evidence that there may have been a trading fort located down on the Strand by 1614. Now, we don't know if that is True, but if it is, it's a very interesting fact that within five years of Henry Hudson sailing up the Hudson River, six years before the pilgrims came to the Massachusetts colony, there may have been the beginnings of a settlement here in Kingston. But Kingston is really considered first settled uh, in 1652 with the arrival of a man named Thomas Chambers, who was our first lecture series subject by Ted Dietz. Uh, when Thomas Chambers and a few others came from what is now Albany, it was Fort Orange and Beverwick, uh, to Kingston. It was called the Sopus at the time. But they came down in 1652 and 1653, and they settled in what we call the Lowlands, which is now what is Hannaford Plaza going out to Manor Avenue. Uh, it was low-lying land. It was very fertile. Uh, the Indians had been farming it for hundreds of years. Uh, and they began their settlements. So. Almost immediately, problems began between the settlers and the Native Americans, and they were both at fault. Uh, the settlers didn't pen in their animals, who trampled and ate the crops of the, uh, of the Native Americans. The Native Americans had a very unusual way of getting the settlers to plow their crops for free. They would go to the settler's house with a torch, a lit torch, and the settlers' homes had thatched roofs, so the Native Americans would threatened to burn their homes unless they plowed the land for free. So as you can see, there were constant problems. Uh, and every time there's a problem, the settlers sent down to New Amsterdam, which is New York City today, to the governor there, who is this man, Peter Stuyvesant. Uh, Peter Stuyvesant was a director general of New Amsterdam at the time. And every time there was a problem, Peter Stuyvesant would either come up himself or he would send up troops. And this went on for six years. Finally, in 1658, Peter Stuyvesant said, this is crazy. Uh, you, you live scattered about. You can't act in your own mutual defense unless you agree to relocate 
to a place that is more defensible, uh, where you can act in your mutual defense and build a stockade barracks, uh, I'm not going to help you. So it's up to you. If you want to relocate to a place that's more defensible, not only will I continue to help you, I will send a permanent garrison up here. If you don't, you're on your own. So the settlers met, uh, they discussed it, and they decided, yes, we will relocate. Uh, so Peter Stuyvesant selected the, stock, the early stockade district, which is actually where we are located right now. Uh, and here is a picture of the 1695 Miller map. And uh, this represents the stockade district as we envision it today. But the district that Peter Stuyvesant originally laid out, and he actually picked it out, he surveyed it, and and laid out the first 16 lots. The original stockade that Peter Stuyvesant laid out went up what's now Clinton Avenue, it was East Front Street at the time, to North Front Street. It went a little bit past Wall Street to John Street. So only that little section was the original stockade. In 1661, the stockade extended out to Green Street. In 1670, it extended about halfway through here and by 1677, it had extended south to Main Street, and that's to what we now consider the original, uh, we consider that the stockade district today. Um, this, there is an inaccuracy in this map, however. Uh, Wall Street ended at John Street. It didn't go through to North Front Street until about 1830. Um, but other than that, this is an accurate representation of the 1777 stockade district, but again, the original district began right here. The first courthouse was located most likely right here, right at the intersection of Wall Street to John. Uh, that, we believe, is where the location of the first uh, community, home, community house, the, it was the church, it was the minister's home, and it was where the court was located. Um, I think we learned last month that there was another building located right there. Does anyone remember? John Vanderlyn's house. Yeah, that's right. We believe that John Vanderlyn's home was built on the foundations of the original community house courthouse. Uh, so the original courthouse is located there. By 1689, the courthouse is located right here where it is today, in the same exact location. It was probably there earlier, but we know without a doubt it was there by 1689, making the property that the courthouse is located on the oldest parcel in the United States to house a public building. The original courthouse was probably somewhat modest, uh, and that was in use until 1732. It was under constant repair, and by 1732, its condition had deteriorated to a point that a new uh, jail and courthouse needed to be built. So there was a resolution in 1732 authorizing the construction of a new courthouse. There was uh, some difficulty in raising the funds, but construction was underway by 1737. That courthouse became what we call today the 1777 courthouse. And here's a picture of the 1777 courthouse. It's called the 1770 cour 1777 courthouse because of what happened there in 1777. But this is the structure that was burnt by the British, along with almost every other building in Kingston, uh, October 16th, 1777. But this courthouse was in effect, and there were constant renovations and repairs from 1732 till it was burned. And when it was burned, they burned the, all the wood portions of the building, but the stone structure remained. To the settlers' credit, uh, to the Kingstonians' credit at this point, they almost immediately began rebuilding. And it was rebuilt, and it was remained in service until 1816. Uh, and again, this is a picture of the 1777 courthouse. It's interesting in that it had the stocks in the front. Those are leg stocks, and those are, I guess, head and arm stocks. So if you were sentenced to the stocks, people could walk up Wall Street and throw tomatoes and garbage at you. It's probably not a bad sentence uh, to have. And if you notice, the, on the south end, this is the south end of the courthouse, there's bars in the windows. That was the original jail. The original jail took up the southern end of the courthouse. So 
uh, again, this courthouse was in use until 1816, at which time its condition had deteriorated to a point that it needed to be uh, completely rebuilt. So in 1816 and 1817, this structure was taken down to the foundation and built again. It was built on the same foundation, uh, but it was reconstructed. So between 1816 and 1818, the courthouse functions moved to this building. This is the DeWall Tavern. The DeWall Tavern is no longer there, but it was located on North Front Street. And it's right about where Nico's Pharmacy in the parking lot is today. The DeWall Tavern was famous for miles around for a very unique characteristic that it had. It had a ballroom on the second floor, yep, with a dance floor. And the dance floor was made of a material, I think cork or something, and it was said to give a spring to your dance step. So it was known as the best dance hall between New York City and Albany, and people came from miles around to dance at the DeWall Tavern. Uh, but the DeWall Tavern actually housed the courthouse while the new construction went on. Uh, the prior courthouse actually housed the county clerk, what we county clerk today, it was then the uh, clerk of the uh, court of common pleas or something like that. Uh, it, that was located in the courthouse. When the courthouse moved to DeWall Tavern, the clerk's office moved to the Tappan House, the Christopher Tappan House, which is located on the corner of Wall Street and uh, North Front Street. It's where Dominic's Dreamweavers is uh, today. So. The, in 1818, the courthouse was completed and the functions moved back to there. This is a picture of our present courthouse from the front uh, by the dress of the gentleman in the front. It's probably early 1900s, but it, this is still what the front of our courthouse looks today. The 1818 courthouse ended right about here. Um, and that, again, was built in the same, lo the same location as the original 1689 courthouse. So it's been in the same place all that time. This addition right here uh, was an addition put on in 1834 as an extension of the jail. Uh, here is the overview of the architectural plans uh, that Mark Phelan had provided. Uh, the original 1818 courthouse was here. It's the first structure up here, and my hand's a little, but right there. This is what I just showed you, the 1834 edition. It currently houses our DA's office and part of uh, Judge Karen Peters' chambers. This, was in a, this edition was put on in 1868 as an extension for the jail. This edition right here was put on in 1897. That's our ceremonial courtroom. If you've had jury duty or you've gone to an event at the courthouse, you probably went to the big old courthouse with the old dark wood. It's beautiful. That was put on in 1897. And this addition in the back was added on as another jail addition, and that was put on in 1899. So that is our courthouse as it exists today. The 1899 uh, addition now contains a, a number of court rooms as well as uh, Judge James Gilpatrick's chambers. Uh, but the jail was actually located in the courthouse until I think uh, the 60s, the early 60s and when it, 70s when it moved to Golden Hill. But that's our courthouse today and I will tell you, uh, as we'll go through momentarily, the events that have occurred in our courthouse are unbelievable. But the question that I am asked more than any other court, uh, any question regarding the courthouse, not was this person there, and what did this person do there, and did this really happen? The question I'm always asked is, where were the gallows? <laughs> I, I had, oops, I'm gonna go back to this picture. I had always been told that there were gallows in the courthouse. I had been told they'd been anywhere from up here in the cupola to right here, which is now our grand jury room. The answer to that question is there were no gallows in the courtroom. Uh, the courthouse. They were never in there um, th for a couple reasons. One, when there was an execution, that was a public event. Everybody came and you wanted everybody to come. It served as a deterrent and sadly it was also entertainment. So you wanted as many people there as you could and in those places you would not have been able to get many people. Second, after you did the execution, 
you had to remove the body. I will tell you, I've been up in this cupola. If you tried to get a body down out of there, you know, you would, it wouldn't work. There's a bell up there now. Um, and there was always a bell up there. So there was never a gallows in the courthouse. Uh, it's my understanding that there was a place where public executions occurred. I believe it was down uh, a little bit past Main on Wall Street. Uh, so to answer your question, I'm sure that's probably what most people came here. That was a question you had. <laughs> you wanted that answered and now you can leave. All right. We have had four judges in the Ulster County Courthouse who have gone on to become United States Supreme Court judges. That's an amazing statistic, that we've had four judges who have presided over cases in our courthouse who have gone on to become United States Supreme Court judges. The first of those is this man, Henry Brockholz Livingston. He's known to posterity as Brockholz Livingston. He had a relative named Henry, and he dropped the Henry to avoid confusion. He's part of the famous Livingston clan, uh, but he was originally from New York. I'll call our Livingstons the Livingstons from Claremont. He was originally from uh, New York City, but he was a cousin to Robert Livingston from across the river. Uh, he began his career as an aide to Benedict Arnold in the Revolutionary War. And you have to remember that prior to Benedict Arnold becoming the most famous traitor in American history, he was without question our greatest general. And had he not been a traitor, he probably would be known as one of our greatest patriots. Uh, but so when Brockos Livingston was an aide to Benedict Arnold, that was a position of honor. He went on to become private secretary to his brother-in-law, John Jay. John Jay had married his sister. And he was John Jay's private secretary when John Jay was minister to Spain. But he became a fervent anti-federalist and a rabid Jeffersonian. And he started writing what I'll call poison pen missives against the noted Federalists of the day to the uh, media, including his brother-in-law, John Jay, which I assume made family gatherings a little tense. <laughs> he wrote them anonymously, but everybody knew who wrote it. Uh, and he was so outspoken, there was actually a, an assassination attempt on his life at one point. On another time, a, he was walking down the street, a Federalist came up and punched him in the face. They each towns each other to a duel in which uh, Brockholz Livingston killed the man. So he was a very outspoken uh, Jeffersonian at the time. And he became Thomas Jefferson's second appointment to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, but he was a New York State Supreme Court justice from 1802 to 1807. And that was when he presided over cases in the Ulster County Courthouse while on, on circuit. In 1807, Thomas Jefferson appointed him to the United States Supreme Court, and he was actually on the John Marshall Court, which is the court that really made the United States Supreme Court a, uh, a really independent and third branch of the government. His decisions on the Supreme Court were much more staid, and he, didn't, he wasn't nearly as outspoken when he got in the court. Our second judge is this man. His name is Smith Thompson. Smith Thompson was originally from Amenia over in Dutchess County. Um, he was also appointed to, as a uh, justice in the New York, uh, on the New York Supreme Court in 1802. So he served with Brockholz Livingston. He was a New York State Supreme Court justice uh, from 1802 to 1818, the last four years of which he was chief justice in New York State. In 1818, he left the, the bench, uh, and again, it's between 1802 to 1818, he sat at times in the Ulster County Supreme Court and presided over cases. In 1818, again, he left the bench to become United States Secretary of the Navy. And in 1823, he very reluctantly accepted appointment by James Monroe uh, as an Associate Justice on the United States Supreme Court. He was actually appointed to fill the seat vacated by the death of Brockholz Livingston. And I say he took that appointment reluctantly because Smith Thompson had higher aspirations. In fact, he believed that he could be President of the United States. So it was a, with much reluctance that he uh, accepted the appointment, but he did serve on the United States Supreme Court for the rest of his life until 1843. Our third Supreme Court Justice is this man, uh, Rufus Peckham. What was that? Oh, he does look. Listen, I'm going to actually take offense to that because I recently found out that I am distantly related to Rufus Peckham. 
uh, my mother is a Peckham, so I, he is a distant relative. His, again, his name is Rufus Peckham. If you look closely and if I scowl, I'm sure you'll, <laughs> you will see the, you'll see the resemblance. Uh, but Rufus Peckham was originally from Albany, and he was from a very noted f uh, legal family. He was an Albany County District Attorney. And in 1883, he, was a, uh, he became a New York State Supreme Court Justice. Between 1883 and 1886, again, he was uh, hearing cases in the Ulster County uh, Courthouse while on circuit. In 1886, he became a judge on the New York State Court of Appeals, which had become the highest court in New York State. The New York Court of Appeals became New York's highest court in 1846. Uh, but in 1883, he uh, took a seat on that bench. He was there until 1896, at which time he was appointed to the United States Supreme Court by Grover Cleveland and served the rest of his life until 1909 on that court. His decisions are markedly pro-business, which makes sense because among his best friends were John D. Rockefeller, uh, J.P. Morgan, and the Vanderbilts. Our fourth and without question our most important Supreme Court justice is this man, John Jay. John Jay is one of our most unsung founding fathers. John Jay was an incredibly important man. But John Jay was the first sitting judge in the Ulster County Courthouse after the birth of New York State. Uh, John Jay is also one of the three writers of the Federalist Papers, which were persuasive essays that were published throughout the country to convince everybody that we needed a strong central government, that the loose collection of states under the Articles of Confederation were just not working, and that we needed a United States Constitution. Uh, and the Federalist Papers are, are really one of the main reasons that the United States Constitution passed. The other two writers were Alexander Hamilton and James Madison. John Jay was also George Washington's first choice as Secretary of State in his initial administration. Now, John Jay declined that position, leaving George Washington to have to resort to his second choice, who was Thomas Jefferson. He did accept appointment, however, uh, from George Washington as first Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And that is the official portrait of John Jay in his Chief Justice robes. The original hangs in the United States Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. today. But John Jay came to the Ulster County Courthouse prior to becoming a judge there. John Jay came to the Ulster County Courthouse in February of 1777 with the Committee of Safety. And they met in the Ulster County Courthouse to determine what kind of government New York was going to have. And the first thing that they had to do was write a constitution. John Jay wrote the New York State Constitution in the Ulster County Courthouse. It was written there, it was debated there, and it was passed there April 20th, 1777. So 236 years from tomorrow, there you go, New York State was born. We are without question the birthplace of New York State. It was actually read in public for the first time two days later on the steps out on Wall Street, uh, April 22nd. So again, while we are without question the birthplace of New York State, we're really one of the birthplaces of the United States because the United States Constitution is based primarily on the New York State Constitution. So an amazing achievement. And when I say that John Jay wrote the New York State Constitution, I mean he actually wrote it. We have the draft of the New York State Constitution. It's in the, Ar the State Archives in Albany. It's in John Jay's handwriting. But he had help from a couple people. One of them was this man, Robert Livingston, who I'll call R. Livingston. Robert Livingston lived across the river in Claremont. In fact, Claremont was a name and is the name of his home today. Uh, Robert Livingston was part of the Committee of Safety, which became the Constitutional Convention. And he was part of the committee to write the New York State Constitution. But Robert Livingston was part of another famous committee to write a document. Robert Livingston was part of the Committee of Five to write the Declaration of Independence. This is the famous Jonathan Trumbull portrait of the Committee of Five presenting the Declaration of Independence to the Second Continental Congress and its president, uh, John Hancock. The Committee of Five consisted of John Adams, Roger Sherman, who was from Connecticut, the guy in the middle, that's Robert Livingston, Thomas Jefferson, and Ben Franklin. Now, this is not an act an actual portrayal of what happened at the signing of the Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> Jonathan Trumbull painted this years later. He went around uh, and painted the likeness of any of the signers that were still alive. 
Any that were not alive and that had portraits done of them during their lifetime, he used that. There were some that had none, no portraits, and were uh, no longer alive. Those he painted a likeness based upon the descriptions of the people who knew him as best he could. So uh, again, while everybody who was part of the Second Continental Congress is in there, uh, this is not what happened on the day of the signing. In fact, Robert Livingston never signed the Declaration of Independence. He was part of the Committee of Five. He was called back to New York prior to the signing and never signed it. He had a cousin named Philip Livingston, who is known to us today as Philip the Signer, because he signed. <laughs> and Robert Livingston is known to us today as the Chancellor, because he was the Chancellor of New York, which is the highest legal officer in New York State. Um, Robert Livingston is also the person who deserves sole credit for the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, Thomas Jefferson wanted to buy the Port of New Orleans from France uh, for $2 million. Uh, at the time, Robert Livingston was the minister to France. When uh, that offer was presented, uh, Napoleon, who was the leader of France at the time, was in desperate need of funds for his many military adventures. So France said, you know what? We'll do you one better. We will sell you not only New Orleans, all this land, which is the middle part of the United States today, for $15 million. Robert Livingston couldn't pick up the phone and call Thomas Jefferson, who was president, and ask him whether he should do this. He would have had to send a letter, write a letter, would have had to go across the Atlantic, would have taken weeks, if not months, get to Washington, D.C., get an answer. Couldn't do it. So Robert Livingston said, you know what? I have no authority for this, uh, but I know a good deal when I see it. I'm going to agree to it. And he did. He did it without authority, and that's fortunate for us because he really made, he put us on the track to where we eventually became. Um, he doesn't get the credit for that, and he really deserves it. Robert Livingston was also the uh, partner of Robert Fulton in the invention of the steamship. Uh, the first steamship trip went up the Hudson in front of Robert Livingston's home, Claremont, in honor of him. Uh, in fact, today the uh, first steamboat is known as a Claremont, right? Actually, it is a great feather in our cap to, to that that is the common belief, but the first steamboat was actually not named the Claremont. It was named the North River Steamship. North River was the name of the Hudson, part of the Hudson. Robert Fulton's biographer uh, wrote his biography a few years after Robert Fulton's death, and he mistakenly wrote that the name of the first steamship, and this is actually a picture of the first steamship, but it was not the Claremont. But thanks to that error, we today can tell everybody, yeah, no, no, I saw a picture, it's the Claremont. It wasn't. Now, I've just given you a, a number of reasons why our nation should be thankful to Robert Livingston. Here in Kingston, we have another reason to be thankful for Robert Livingston. After the British burned Kingston in October of 1777, uh, the citizens here were destitute. They burned almost every building, and people lost everything. Robert Livingston also had his home burned and his farms burned, so he suffered personally too. But he made a gift to the trustees of Kingston to be dispersed among the, re the residents of Kingston as the trustees felt would uh, helped the most, 5,000 acres of his own property. It's part of the original Hardenburg patent. The property, the land is now today in Delaware, uh, Delaware County. In fact, one of the towns is known as New Kingston. So it was an unbelievable gesture from a man who suffered greatly. Uh, so we really owe him a great deal of thanks. And he does not get the credit that he deserves. Uh, another individual who helped write the New York State Constitution was this man, Governor Morris. Governor Morris is another one of our founding fathers who does not get the credit he deserves. He was incredibly important, but he was such an abrasive person that everybody hated him. <laughs> so uh, he does, he's kind of been waylaid a bit, but Governor Morris was part of the Committee of Safety that met in our courthouse, and he was part of the committee to write the New York State Constitution. We owe him the thanks for the provision in our Constitution, which was the only Constitution out of all the uh, colonies to provide that the executive of New York State be elected by the people. So the governor was, from the beginning, elected by the people of the state of New York, and it was the only Constitution 
to include that. Every other state uh, didn't trust the people to elect the executive, and they provided for the election of the executive by the legislature. Uh, and it's kind of strange because Governor Morris was a true aristocrat and always was very wary of the power of the people. But he maintained uh, and was adamant that that had to be put in and it remained in. He also uh, was the spokesperson for the Continental Army in Congress. And he worked tirelessly with George Washington to get supplies and to keep our, the Continental Army supplied. Did an incredible job with that. As Assistant Minister of Finance, Governor Morris is the one who came up with our decimal-based monetary system. He's also the one that came up with the term dollar and cent. He went on to become the chairperson of the Erie Canal Project, and the, the Erie Canal changed not only New York State, but the United States. It was incredibly important. He is also, with James Madison, the writer of the United States Constitution. Governor Morris is the one who came up with the phrase, we the people. For us locally, Governor Morris is also the one who made what I think of as the most famous motion during the uh, New York State Constitutional Convention. Governor Morris was the one who made the motion that the uh, delegates be able to smoke during proceedings. <laughs> the jail was located in the courthouse, and the Ulster County Jail had become the New York Provincial, Provincial Congress's jail. So what they did is they took out all the, the criminals and they put all the political prisoners in there. The conditions were atrocious and the smell was horrible. Governor Morris made that motion right in the beginning that they'd be able to smoke. The legend always was that due to the Dutch influence of the area and the aversion to tobacco, that motion failed. So proceedings moved down the road to Bogarda's Tavern, which is on the corner of uh, Fair and Maiden Lane, and the Constitution was deliberated and passed there. That's not true. The motion passed. It passed by three votes. Uh, and they were able to smoke at will. And everything happened in the courthouse. So again, he was an incredible person. Uh, does not get the credit that he deserves. Another man that we've had as a judge in our courthouse and a past subject of our lecture series is this man, Alton Parker. Uh, Alton Parker was a, a subject presented by John Waddellin. But Alton Parker was a Kingston attorney for many years in our courthouse, became an Ulster County Surrogates Court judge. Then he became Ulster County Supreme Court judge. He then became a Court of Appeals judge, which again is the highest court in New York. It's located in Albany. He remains today the youngest person to ever serve on the New York State Court of Appeals. Very soon after he went up to the Court of Appeals, he became the chief judge. So he was a chief judge in New York State. And in 1904, he became the Democratic Party's candidate for President of the United States. He ran against Teddy Roosevelt. He ran unsuccessfully, but he ran the entire campaign from his home in a sopus, a place called Rosemont. It's still there. It's privately owned. And presidential historians have said that the 1904 presidential election is one of the only elections in our history where the voters had a choice of two top-rate candidates. So everybody thought that Alton Parker would have made a great president. Uh, so he was an incredible person. It's one of the few elections where both candidates were from the same state. Teddy Roosevelt is from Long Island. There was an, uh, a presidential election where both candidates were from the same county. That was Dutchess County when FDR ran against Thomas Dewey. It has nothing to do with our courthouse, but I found it interesting. <laughs> We've also had a number of important individuals who have appeared in our courthouse as attorneys and litigants, including that number is this man, George Clinton. Um, George Clinton was an Ulster County resident. He was a, an attorney in the Ulster County Courthouse for many years. He was Ulster County clerk. He's our longest serving Ulster County clerk. He was Ulster County clerk for 52 years. We hope that uh, Nina Posipak surpasses that. Um, but, but until then, George Clinton is the longest serving Ulster County clerk. Uh, during the Revolutionary War, he became a Brigadier General first in the New York State Militia, then in the Continental Army. In fact, George Washington thought so highly of George Clinton that when he rode to his first swearing-in ceremony uh, as President of the United States, he could only choose one person to ride in the carriage with him. Everyone wanted to be that person. George Washington chose George Clinton. 
He is also the first governor of New York and our longest serving governor. He was elected a total of seven times. And you may have seen this monument. It is right in the front of the courthouse. Uh, I took this in the winter, so the snow disguised it a little bit. But that monument marks the spot where George Clinton was sworn in as first governor of New York. And that was the first official act in New York State. He went on to become vice president of the United States uh, under both Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. It's one of only two individuals who ever served as vice presidents under different presidents. And when he died in office in Washington, D.C., April 20th, 1812, so 201 years ago tomorrow, he was the first person to ever lie in state in the U.S. Capitol. He's buried in the Congressional Cemetery down in Washington, D.C. And in 1908, he was exhumed and brought up to Kingston. It was a huge event. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was president at the time he came. A Navy flotilla brought his body up to Hudson. 40,000 people attended the event. Uh, he was an important guy. But he was reinterred right across the street in the Old Dutch. This is the monument uh, on his grave. This is the actual monument that was on his grave in Washington, D.C. When they brought his body up here, they actually dismantled the monument and brought that up as well. I'm going to go back to the Jonathan Trumbull portrait, because George Clinton was also a member of the Second Continental Congress. And George Clinton is seated right here. He's a third in. I can't, my hand keeps moving, but. George Clinton is located right here, third in. Uh, now, again, this is not an accurate portrayal of what happened at the signing. George Clinton was part of the Second Continental Congress. He was there for the vote of independence, and he voted in favor of independence. But he was called out of Congress prior to the signing by George Washington, who needed his military services. So George Clinton also never signed the Declaration of Independence. But when this portrait was painted, where each of these people is located was incredibly important. George Clinton, again, he's the third in. The man one in, the guy in the middle, is Sam Adams. If you could credit only one person with the United States declaring independence from Great Britain, without question, that person would be Sam Adams. If you walk down the street in 1777 and you ask a person walking by which of the founding fathers they knew, they would know George Washington. They would know Thomas Jefferson. In New York, they might know Alexander Hamilton. Uh, they might know John Adams. They would absolutely know Sam Adams. They would all know him. Uh, so by seating George Clinton next to Sam Adams, that was a position of honor when this painting was made. The man on the end is Richard Henry Lee. Richard Henry Lee is the man who made the motion for the colonies to declare independence. The Declaration of Independence was simply a written uh, memorialization of that motion. Uh, so again, by placing George Clinton where he was, that showed in just how important he was. He was an incredible person. Another man that we've had as an, uh, as an attorney in our courthouse for m a number of years, and another past subject of our series, is this man, George Sharp. Uh, Walt Wachowski did a wonderful presentation on George Sharp. For my money, George Sharp is one of the most important people in the history of the United States. And it's very sad that most people here in Kingston, where he lived, don't even know who he was. But George Sharp was an attorney for many years in our, in, in our courthouse. He was a lifelong resident of Kingston. It's buried today in Wilwick Cemetery. He lived at 1 Albany Avenue, where the Clinton Hotel is now. In fact, Tom Hafey's office is probably right about maybe in the den. Uh, <laughs> This is a picture of his home. It was known as the Orchard. In that home stayed two United States presidents, Ulysses S. Grant and Chester Arthur, and famed Civil War General William Tecumseh Sherman. They all came to Kingston to visit George Sharp, and they stayed at his home. Uh, George Sharp, in the Civil War, recruited and then led the Ulster 120th Regiment, which is one of the most famous regiments in the Civil War. They fought in almost every major battle and they played a critical role on the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg. George Sharp also formed and led the Bureau of Military Information, known as the BMI. Uh, the BMI was the first all-source intelligence agency in history. 
George Sharp invented modern military intelligence. We still use the strategies today that he invented. And the BMI is a major, was a major impact in the eventual victory of the Union over the South. So it's incredibly important. Uh, he became a principal advisor for Ulysses S. Grant. And George Sharp was actually in the room at the McLean House at Appomattox Courthouse when Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant. There's many pictures of that event. Uh, it's incredibly famous. It was when Robert E. Lee surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia and really is, is the beginning of the end of the war. It's really the end of the war. This is a portrait of uh, the surrender. Here's Robert E. Lee. He's then shaking hands after he signed the surrender papers. There's Ulysses S. Grant. Right up here is George Sharp. Uh, he was present at that one of the most monumental events in, in our history. What I find very, very interesting, uh, it's probably a lesser uh, important fact historically, but for, I found it very interesting, is you see these candles right here on this table? George Sharp bought those candles. He bought them from the owner of the McLean house. He bought them back to his house after the war at Albany Avenue, and they were, they were displayed on his mantelpiece for the rest of his life. Upon his death, his family donated the, those candlesticks to, to here, to the Senate House Museum. The Senate House Museum has them on permanent loan to the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian owns and runs the McLean House at Appomattox Courthouse. Here's a picture of the actual room in the McLean House, and this is the actual desk that Robert E. Lee signed the surrender. And this is the desk that, that Ulysses S. Grant uh, sat at. George Sharp in that portrait would have been right about here. These are the Sharp candlesticks. Um, they, uh, they're back home where they belong. Although, two days ago I was at my father's house and he told me, I was just in a Maddox courthouse. They're not on the table anymore. They're in, a, they're in a case in the back. So I said, why are you telling me this today? <laughs> The presentation is in two days. I already have the, I can't change the slides. So uh, I'm just gonna say, you know what? They're temporarily put in a side cabinet. They're gonna be back there. So if you go there, you'll see it. Uh, George Sharp was delegated probably the greatest responsibility by Ulysses S. Grant after Robert E. Lee surrendered. George Sharp was asked by Ulysses S. Grant to parole uh, the Army of Northern Virginia. When you paroled somebody, you took their promise that they would not bear arms again against the United States until they were either exchanged for another prisoner as part of a prison exchange, or the war was over. Uh, so George Sharp paroled Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. This is a copy of that parole. And this is Robert E. Lee and his staff, and their promise that uh, as part of the surrender, they would not bear arms again again against the United States. And here's George Sharp's promise, that as long as they kept their word, they would not be punished any further by the United States. Now, Abraham Lincoln was a voice of reason. He understood that at the end of the Civil War, we needed to heal. It was not a time for punishment. It was a time to embrace the South and, and bring them back and become a nation again. When he was assassinated, the War Hawks in Congress, uh, they had a different idea completely. They wanted the South to pay. They wanted the South to be punished, particularly Robert E. Lee. They wanted him tried as a traitor, and they wanted him executed. The only thing that kept Robert E. Robert e. Lee alive was George Sharp's promise on behalf of the United States that this would not happen. Now, Robert E. Lee was also a, a, a voice of reason. After he surrendered, there, was, there were many in the Confederate Army, and there were many in the South that did not want to surrender. They wanted to go in the, in the hills, and they wanted to fight as guerrillas, and they wanted to fight a terrorist war and never give up. And Robert E. Lee said, no, the war is over. Go home. Go home to your families. Go home to your, to your farms. It's time to heal. Uh, and he had so much respect and authority that they listened to him. If Robert E. Lee had been executed as, uh, for treason, it's debatable whether the United States would be together today. Uh, it certainly would have knocked back the, 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 the joining of North and South for many, many years. So this is one of the most 
important events, I think, that happened in our history, and it was because of George Sharp. Uh, George Sharp, another interesting fact about him is that after the assassination of President Lincoln, George Sharp was sent to Europe to investigate the possible involvement of other U.S. citizens in that assassination, particularly John Surratt. Uh, and John Surratt, and you've, you've seen the famous picture of the uh, Lincoln assassins hung, there's one woman, uh, and that was Mary Surratt, that was John Surratt's mother. Uh, but when George Sharp went to Europe to do this, he became the first de facto CIA agent in United States history. You may recognize this monument. This is also in the old Dutch church. This is a monument, it's, I've seen it under two names. One, patriotism. The second, daughter of the 120th Regiment. This is a monument that was erected by George Sharp in memory, uh, and well, not in memory, in recognition of the men of the also 120th Regiment. It's a very interesting statue for a couple reasons. One, it's the only statue in the United States erected by a commanding officer to his men. Every other monument is erected by municipality to uh, a general or a regiment, uh, a regiment to its, its leader. This is the only one in the United States erected by a commanding officer to his men. It's also, to my knowledge, the only monument that actually owns the property that it's on. Uh, it, the, the property that the base of the statue is on is actually deeded to the statue. It was done so that it could never be moved. So two interesting facts about that monument next time you walk by. Uh, another individual who was an attorney for a number of years in our courthouse is this man, Ezra Fitch, another subject. I told you this was going to be a refresher. Uh, but uh, Ed, uh, Ed Ford did a great presentation a few months ago. Ezra Fitch was an attorney for a number of years in our courthouse, but Ezra Fitch is most famous for being the Fitch and founder of Abercrombie and & Fitch. Uh, Ezra Fitch came from a wealthy family. His grandfather was also named Ezra Fitch, founded Fitch Bluestone, which was the largest bluestone company in the world. Um, so Ezra Fitch grew up rather wealthy, became an attorney, came, he practiced in Kingston for a number of years. He also did some real estate development. He was in a partnership called Jenkins and Fitch. Uh, but he didn't really like being an attorney, which is a feeling that I'm very familiar with. Um, but he loved being outdoors. And he was the best customer of a store owned by a man named David Abercrombie. And that store was, uh, uh, it was a really high-end outdoor outfitter. The only thing you could compare it to would be a very expensive Orvis. After a number of years, Ezra Fitch con uh, convinced David Abercrombie to allow him to invest and become a partner. And he did. In 1900, he became uh, partners with David Abercrombie, and Abercrombie and Fitch was, was formed. When he became a partner, he said, you know what? We really need to make this stuff more available to the public. It's so expensive and so exclusive that no one can buy it. And as I was the best customer, and I'm now part of the business, something's got to change. David Abercrombie said, absolutely not. This is what I do. You don't like it, you buy me out. So in 1907, Ezra Fitch did buy out David Abercrombie. And from 1907 till 1927, when he retired, he was the sole owner of Abercrombie and Fitch. He was also the one that came up with the idea of the uh, mail order catalog. And he also came up with the idea that he wanted every Abercrombie & Fitch store to have its own feel, uh, which it did. And if you go into an Abercrombie & Fitch store today, they all have their own feel. It is significantly different than what Ezra Fitch would expect it to be. Um, but he's the one who came up with those ideas. And if you're in the courthouse, when you come in through the door, the front or the side door where you have to go through, and you go through a metal detector with security, right across, there's, on the walls, there's a number of Ulster County Bar Association uh, photos. And there's one from 1900. It's actually hard to miss, it's the oldest one there. In the middle of it, there's a big picture, and that is of Alton Parker, who at the time was the Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals. Right above him is a dapper looking young man in a tuxedo, named Ezra H. Fitch. So if you ever go there, uh, you can come in and take a look. He's got a very sly grin on his face, and you know he's up to something, but <laughs> most attorneys are. Uh, this is a copy, uh, this is a picture of Ezra Fitch's home 
It is on the corner of Maiden Lane. This is Maiden Lane and Fair Street. Uh, that's where he lived. This is also a very, very interesting intersection. Right here, you can't see it, but right here, uh, on the, the other, just directly across, was where Bogardus Tavern was located. It's not there now. There's another building. There's actually a sign saying Bogardus Tavern was there. Uh, Bogardus Tavern, after the New York State Constitution passed, the Ulster County Courthouse became the Supreme Court of New York State. The Senate moved to the Senate House here. The Assembly moved to the Bogardus Tavern. And the Governor's Mansion became the Christopher Tappan House, again, located on the corner of uh, wall in North Front where Dominic's is. Um, but the Bogardus Tavern was again located right here. On the other side, diagonal from the Bogardus Tavern was the Elmendorf Tavern. And the Elmendorf Tavern is actually where uh, Dr. Peter Roberts grew up. The Elmendorf Tavern was where the, the uh, George Clinton adherents hung out. The Bogardus Tavern was where the John Jay adherents hung out. And it was always known that after everybody got a few in them, they would meet right in the intersection and fight. And it was, it was a storied intersection and went on for many, many years. The Ulster County Courthouse is also the place where Sojourner Truth's famous case was heard. Um, Sojourner Truth is another past subject. Uh, Ann Gordon did a wonderful job on her. Uh, Sojourner Truth was a slave in Ulster County. The time we're talking about, which is 1825, Sojourner Truth was a slave in New Paltz, what we would now consider West Park, but it was New Paltz at the time. Now, New York began with the gradual abolition of slavery, starting in the early 1800s, culminating with complete abolition July 4th, 1827. In 1825, Sojourner Truth made an agreement with her then owner, who was a man named John Dumont. And that agreement was, if she did a certain amount of work at a one-year period, she would be freed one year early, and her family would be freed as well. The end of the year, she felt that she did. She lived up to her end of the, of the bargain. John Dumont did not. During that year, she had a child, and I believe she lost a few fingers in a work accident. Is that correct, Ann? One finger. One finger. So she lost one finger. Uh, John Dumont felt that she did not live up to her part of the bargain, and refuse to free her. So if you ever learn anything about Sojourner Truth, you probably heard of her famous walk to freedom. She said, I'm leaving, but I'm not running away. I have no reason to run away. She walked. She walked from West Park to Rifton, to a family there uh, who helped her out. Uh, the Van Wagenen family was who ultimately did it. And we have a few Van Wagenens here tonight. Uh, she took her infant daughter with her, but she had to leave the rest of her family behind. Now, the laws that stood in New York in 1826 said, because of the impending abolition of slavery, you cannot sell a slave out of the state of New York. Otherwise, everybody would have just sold uh, all their slaves to uh, a state that slavery was continuing in. John Dumont sold Sojourner Truth's son, Peter, to a neighbor who was also a relative named Solomon Gedney. Solomon Gedney sold Peter to a plantation in Alabama. He sold Peter to his son-in-law and daughter in Alabama in, contraven in contravention of the existing law. So Sojourner Truth came to the courthouse. She walked up the front steps on Wall Street. She walked to the front door that's there today. She didn't know anybody. She didn't have any money. And she started asking some of the attorneys who were there waiting for their case to be called if they could help her. She actually was told by um, some of the local Quakers that she had to find the grand jury so she went up to the most impressively dressed man she could find. She figured he had to be the grand jury. Um, but a number of attorneys helped her. Uh, and the case eventually came before a judge. At the conclusion of that case, a judge made a decision. And the decision was that Peter was going to be, oh, uh, before I get to that. So uh, a writ was issued from the Ulster County Courthouse. And a writ is just an order from the court. And this is a copy of that writ. And this said that Solomon Gedney had to appear in the Ulster County Courthouse, and he had to bring Peter with him. If he didn't, he had to pay $500. Now, in 1828, when this writ was issued, $500 was enough money that Solomon Gedney got in a boat. He went to Alabama, he got Peter, and he came back. And, again, and the case came before a judge, and the judge made a decision. That decision was that Peter was leaving the Ulster County Courthouse that day with one person. 
That person was his mother. So it was a monumental case, and it made Sojourner Truth not only a national figure, it made her an international figure. She spent the rest of her life fighting against slavery and fighting for equality. But if it wasn't for what happened in the Ulster County Courthouse, we probably would never have heard of Sojourner Truth. In fact, she may never have been Sojourner Truth. Her name at the time was Isabella. Uh, she didn't have a last name because slaves weren't given last names. It was felt that it would humanize them. She changed her name to Sojourner Truth uh, later when she was already a noted abolitionist. So it's an incredible place we have. The, the accomplishments that have occurred within the walls of the Ulster County Courthouse have literally changed the world. And I am absolutely confident that those that pass through our courthouse today, our judges, our local bar, and our citizens will continue to impress upon the nation just how special we here in Ulster County are. So uh, I thank you for your time. I hope, you, I hope there wasn't too much of redundancy from some of the figures. Uh, but again, it's incredibly important to appreciate what we have here. And a lot of it occurred in the Ulster County Courthouse. Thank you. Are there any questions? Tom? Outside of the Sojourner Truth case, what would you say is one or possibly two of the most important cases settled, criminal cases? Well, yes. Uh, the question is, aside from the Sojourner Truth case, what, is, what are some of the most important cases that have occurred in the courthouse? Uh, without question, the Sojourner Truth case is the most important. Uh, We've had a number, they would usually be you know, more of a kind of sensationalist type. We've had several murder trials. You have the, uh, the Provenzano case from a number of years ago. Um, I, I mean, I, I can't really tell you beyond a certain point that there's any that really jump out. Um, but again, every case is important. Um, every case really, the quality of life issues in our community are decided in our courthouse. Uh, we all have a stake in our community, and that is where uh, we determine how our community is going to be. Um, so again, except for the sensational type cases, you know, we had the recent gang murder trials, uh, which have done an incredible job in you know, addressing some of the gang activities, but I, I can't really answer that well, the Sojourner Truth case is the one that really stands out. There were a lot of activities when uh, the South uh, uh, attacked Fort Sumter. The courthouse is where the entire town congregated and, and everything started, the enlistments and everything else. So the courthouse is really the, the center of our community and it had, has been since it was first made. The, there is a bell up in the cupola uh, and that was used to call everybody whenever there was an issue that needed people to come together. So uh, I guess the answer is, I, don't, I really don't know. Yes, absolutely. Courthouse, the Old County Courthouse is your courthouse. It belongs to us, to all of us. So it is a public place. You can go in at any time. Uh, you can sit on it in any cases. Grand jury proceedings are, are secret, and you cannot go into the grand jury room, but that's it. I don't even think you'd get to that point, Carl. Uh, but. Yes, they are public places, and we encourage anybody who wants to take a tour of the courthouse, please give me a call at the Commissioner Juror's office. Uh, again, I strongly, strongly believe that the courthouse is where justice is done. And it's important that we see that justice being done, and we do that as jurors when we're, we appear there. We're the ones who make those decisions. But I give tours all the time. I do uh, tours for schools, and I always tell the people who come in as jurors, if you ever want to come, you want to bring your family, give me a call. It's your courthouse, and it's important that you know what happened in it. So at, absolutely, it's a public place, and, and I'd be happy to take you through. I'll, I'll give it to, I can give it to you after. It should be in there anyway. Any other questions? Knowing some of the portraits that currently hang in the courthouse, how come some of these judges, older judges, justices, the pictures don't hang in there? We, 
in the county courtroom, if you ever go in the county courtroom, which is actually the courtroom uh, that was there when Sojourner Truth's case was heard, I think a lot of that happened upstairs in the judge's chambers. But uh, in our county court room, uh, our county court judge now is Judge Donald Williams. Uh, in his courtroom, they have portraits of all the Ulster County judges going back to 1798. The up in our ceremonial courtroom, we have portraits of our, some of our Supreme Court judges. Unfortunately, they didn't start until probably the 1950s. Uh, I recently obtained portraits from the Court of Appeals of John Jay and Alton Parker, which we've put up. Uh, but some of the other judges were circuit court judges, uh, but they should be put up. And maybe that's something we'll work on. Scott works in the courthouse with me. He actually. Uh, keeps the place running, so maybe we'll, we'll see if we can do that. Mark? Uh, could, you, could you change to the second courthouse slide again, uh, the 16, uh, after the, before the break? I can. And would you uh, look at the cupola and comment on the gentleman that's up in the cupola? Is this the 1777, this one? Yes, yes, yes. You had it. You just had it. Yep. Uh, I don't believe that that, well, you know what, you can, you could still go up there. Again, you could see the bell. This is the, it's the same way it is before. Uh, I don't know who the person is. Wait, you see what he's having in his hand? Oh, is it? I can't, I can't see. I don't know. I, I, I always, I, I, I'm not saying gun, but I always thought it was a hand, that he's pointing to something. It looks like that, but if you look closer, you'll, you'll, it's uh, very unusual. That's why I was pointing it out. Is it a gun? I believe so. I always thought it was a hand. I was wondering what he was pointing at. Uh, here's a picture. Um, this picture. Uh, Frank Almquist sent me a number of, of pictures from postcards of the Ulster County Courthouse from really the late 1800s to it looks like they're going to the 1930s. Uh, I'd already put together the slide presentation and I'd picked this one up off the internet, but all of them have a plaque right here, uh, which I had never noticed before. Scott, I asked Scott the other day, Scott, do you know what uh, happened to this plaque? Because it's not there. Uh, and we went, there is a plaque in the basement of the courthouse, but it's from 1863 from a renovation. So we're going to try and see, find out what's there. I'd be very interested to see what's there. Any other questions? Yep. The New York State Supreme Court is a trial level court. Yes. What's the reason why it is trial level as opposed to a real Supreme Court? It wasn't until 1846. Uh, and it, there is really most states, the question is the Ulster County Supreme Court is a trial level court, meaning it's the court where you go to first, not an appellate court. In New York State, the first court you go to is the Supreme Court. If you want to appeal that decision, you go to the appellate division. And the highest court in New York State is the Court of Appeals. Most states, their highest court is the Supreme Court. And I don't know why that is the case, because it is an aberration. But until 1846, the New York Supreme, State Supreme Court was the Supreme Court. When John Jay was a judge sitting here, the Ulster County Supreme Court was the highest court in New York State. He was the chief judge in New York State. Uh, he left, he actually left, it was that until October 16th of 1777. When it, was, when it was burned, they had to move it. They actually moved it to Poughkeepsie. Uh, John Jay stayed in that capacity to 1778 when he left to become president of the uh, Continental Congress. But there, I, I have no idea why they did it because it does, it doesn't really make sense. But that's the way New York State has done it. <laughs> well, well, the issue is. But you wonder why the, high, the Court of Appeals isn't the Supreme Court and the, the original court have a different name. But I don't know. Like most states, their highest court is the Supreme Court. You go to the Supreme Court. But 
So any, it's just an aberration. A New York, one of many New York aberrations. Any other questions? No? All right, well then, I, I would like to, take, before we leave again, I do like to take an opportunity to thank those that make this uh, lecture series possible. Okay. Uh, first, I want to thank the Senate House. They, again, as we've said, they are such a crucial part of this series. They allowed us to do, it, to do this here. They stay open late for us. They set everything up. So if you get a chance, you know, thank them for it. They make it possible for us to have this series. They're also open now, uh, and they have wonderful things going on here. So uh, ask them what's going on, and please come down and see it. Uh, Bob Rizzo in the back. Bob films all of these. Anybody who wants a DVD of this lecture or any of our lectures, I believe he has a couple tonight from uh, Joe Tantillo's presentation on John Vanderlyn uh, last month. But you can contact him or talk to him and get them. Uh, Bob is really a true professional, and he has made, uh, he really, if you've seen any of the videos, they were playing on public access TV. Uh, he does a wonderful job, so we want to thank him. Uh, the people who really publicize this, who are probably the reason that, that you heard about this in the first place. Uh, Hugh Reynolds, again, Hugh is always here and always does a nice spread in the Kingston Times. Uh, we want to thank him, and Hugh, in a few months, is going to be one of our presenters. Uh, so you have to make sure you'll be here from that. I'll have to take the notes, and I will write a story. <laughs> we'll see how his... <laughs> it's, it's nice to have that, so we'll see, nice we'll see what he writes about me. Um, Jillian Fisher is here. Jillian Fisher, uh, she sends out an email. Uh, she's done a great job for our series and for everything going on in Kingston. In fact, she hounds me relentlessly to finish up the press releases so that they can get out in time. So we want to thank her. Friends of Historic Kingston, they do a great job with, with their promotion of Kingston uh, without the series, but they also do a great job promoting our series. They put it on their website, and we appreciate that. Ulster County Tourism, Kingston Community Radio, Kingston Happenings, the Daily Freeman Preview, uh, all these uh, people, they help. They get the word out, and we want to thank them for that. Walt Wilkowski, Walt, again, besides from being a, one of our presenters, he always takes our flyers and puts them on the uh, Civil War Roundtable, so we appreciate that. I also want to take a chance to thank uh, Kingston's Buried Treasures, because uh, Kingston's Buried Treasures really uh, puts this all together, and, and it is a great series. We've done a great job, and it's, it's largely because of Kingston's Buried Treasures. So Joe Tantillo, again, Joe, besides for being our last month's presenter, he puts together all these. Uh, he puts together the flyers. He puts together the PowerPoint presentation, so he does a great job. Ed Ford, you know, what can you say about Ed? What can you say about Ed? Um, uh, uh, Ann Gordon, our Ulster County historian. Uh, Ann does a wonderful job with everything she does on, uh, throughout the county. Pat Murphy, I saw Pat in the back. Uh, Pat is part of this. Tom Hafe, uh, Kingston Alderman is part of this. Uh, Nina Posupak, our county clerk. Uh, these guys really do a wonderful job. So please, if you get a chance, thank them. Uh, and again, I want to thank all of you. Without you, we wouldn't be doing this. Well, we may, and but it would. Well, thank, well, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll tell you uh, our upcoming presentations. Next month, May 17th, uh, right here at 5.30, we are gonna be, gonna be doing a presentation on Colonel George Pratt, who was the leader of the Ulster 20th, known as the Ulster Guard, in, uh, during the Civil War. Seward Osborne, who uh, anybody who's in, uh, interested in the Civil War knows Seward or knows of him. Uh, he, I, I defy you to find someone who knows more about the Civil War than Seward, but he'll be here for that. Uh, as an aside for George Pratt, George Pratt is actually the one who, prior to the Civil War, he was part of the Ulster County Historical Society. He wrote the premier uh, story of the burning of Kingston. He went through, he actually looked at the documents that were in London that were filed from the, uh, from the British side and he wrote what happened in the burning of Kingston. It really is the preeminent statement of the burning of Kingston. If you get a chance, I know they sell the, uh, the, store, the pamphlet at Friends of Historic Kingston. In June, June 21st, 2013, we are gonna be doing a presentation on Samuel Kirkendall, a true monument I mean, he was a, mo uh, uh, a industrial monster. 
Uh, he was a son-in-law of, of, I mean that in a large sense. Uh, you know, he was, he was in effect uh, a robber baron, as his father-in-law Thomas Cornell was, but he made an incredible impact uh, on this community. We are gonna be doing that. This is my daughter, Alex. I think she wants to come up, and she, I think she is our youngest uh, attendee ever. I think she's at the end of it, but this is Alex. Um, the Samuel Kirkendall presentation is actually going to be somewhere different. We're going to mix it up a little bit. It's going to be at the Montrepose Cemetery. And if you have ever been down there, there's a wonderful memorial. It's called the uh, Cork, uh, Kirkendall Cornell uh, Memorial. It has Thomas Cornell and Samuel Kirkendall and their family members. We're going to be doing it there. Uh, so it's going to be a nice summer night. Ed Ford is going to be our presenter, so please uh, make sure you come there. And on that note, before we leave, I would be remiss if I didn't say happy birthday. Ed. Okay. Ed turned 95 on Monday. April 15th, tax day, I think we should all, instead of seeing April 15th as tax day, from now on, think of it as Ed Ford Day. So Ed, happy birthday. Uh, and Ann Gordon would like to say something first. Uh, as county historian, I want to remember a very historic event that happened last year on April 20th, which was our celebration of the 200th anniversary of the death of George Clinton. And I don't know how many of you were in Kingston for that wonderful day with two marching bands, hundreds of school children waving flags, many dignitaries, 17 different floral arrangements laid at the foot of Clinton's uh, memorial statue. Uh, it was a wonderful event and it's, that event is the reason why we're here tonight. This committee who worked together to put together that event, when we got through, we said we had such a wonderful time doing that. Let's do more. And the result is Kingston's Buried Treasures. So happy first birthday to us. Thank you. So thank you, everyone. And I hope we will see you next month, May 17th. Uh, again, the third Friday of the month, 5.30. Uh, we hope you can make it. All right, thank you again. And everyone have a good weekend.